All right, so let's dive right into this main topic of this hour, and we're joined now by Brent Sadler, Senior Fellow Center for National Defense at the Heritage Foundation, and Vitaly Rishko, Ukraine Program Coordinator, Ukraine Program Global Governance Institute. Good to have you both on World Tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you both for being here. Now, um, last time both um, Lavrov and Xi Jinping met was in 2018, so it was six years ago. However, um, what's very interesting is that usually, it seems that usually, heads of state do not meet with foreign ministers. Am I looking way too deep into it, or is this something we should um, discuss? Brent, the first, the first question for you. Um, well, I wouldn't read too much into it. Lavrov is you know, been around for decades, playing the same role, the same game. Um, and he does have a lot of uh, connection back to Putin, and he does have a lot of influence uh, back in Moscow. So I wouldn't undercut that and, and, and look at too much into that. And, and it's important to note that Putin and Xi Jinping have met several times, even after the invasion in February of tw uh, 2022. Uh, and so that relationship is not being hidden. It is comprehensive, it is explicit, and it is certainly focused at undermining the United States specifically, but the West more broadly. Yeah, and I think uh, that's an interesting point there. And Vitaly, I mean, let's look at this also from uh, these these quotes we're hearing. And we've heard also that, uh, you know, uh, pledging to defend this multipolar world, it seems that uh, China and Russia are trying to claim uh, something very international, something uh, very peaceful, where I think it looks very different. Let's also throw in there the idea of, of the BRICS and now BRICS plus the new member states that joined earlier this year. I mean, how much of an influence and how worrying uh, is this new, uh, let's say, multipolar world that the Chinese and the Russians are presenting to us? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that it's a very attractive idea to promote and it's so easy to be sold, actually, to the international audience because, uh, yeah, it is very attractive. And uh, however, I have uh, reasonable doubts whether Chinese authorities truly mean what they say concerning the multiple world, world order. Uh, I believe for them uh, they are willing to make the, the world at least a bipolar um, international order and at the best to overtake the US role as a global uh, leading power. Uh, well, and I also believe that sometimes we in the West we tend to perceive this um, partnership between China and Russia as something very strategic. But in reality, I believe that uh, their interests, their strategic interests, yeah, to some extent they align, but um, in general, they, uh, they also diverge because uh, what uh, is very, um, sounds very promising to Russia, which is basically the complete destruction of the security architecture, uh, return of great power politics, uh, power politics in, uh, in general, uh, that is not something that uh, Beijing is interested in um, because for them, um, yeah, they, they've benefited a lot from the Western-led international order and um, I don't see the reasons for them to completely destroy that one, uh, but rather to modify it. Now, Brent, um, Beijing claims that it's neutral when it comes to the war in Ukraine, but it turns out that it's a key economic lifeline for, uh, for Russia's economy right now. Why do they um, need to pretend or make this, um, they play with this, the word of neutrality? What do they need it for? Hmm. Uh, well, that's a good question. I, I think money is probably the first one, is they don't want to actually come under economic sanctions. There's too much money to be made if they can continue to operate, you know, in the open in, do, in making their business deals, but also keeping the options open uh, to do, you know, black market trading, which it's no secret the Chinese have been moving uh, microelectronics through through Hong Kong to Russia for quite some time since the invasion in February 2022. So I, I put it first and foremost, it's self-interest. Uh, but you know, when push comes to shove, and I think we're getting close to the shove part here, where, it's ve where they're not hiding anymore how much they are working in collaboration in the war effort in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. 
But I want to jump in on that, Brett, because we've, we've heard this uh, push and shove, and I think we've observed, and you've observed, of course, China-U.S. relations yeah. for quite some time. On the one hand, we have the, the economics, which is a, in a different uh, realm as the military part. Uh, but at the same time, I want to throw a number at you, 75. Uh, that was mentioned today as also uh, celebrating those 75 years of diplomatic relations between uh, Russia and, and China. I believe Putin is supposed to make a trip to China in, in, the, in the spring at some point, maybe in May. We're not sure when exactly. And then inversely, we have 75 years of NATO as well this year. So kind of uh, two very interesting numbers, two very different world systems. But really, how close? And we talked about confrontation for a long time. But it does seem to me still that the Chinese are still winning this. They still have their allies. They still have an outreach to the global south. The BRICS plus is growing. So who's really winning this competition? Are we sliding really into more confrontation? Or is, it, uh, is there something else that I'm missing here? Tell us your assessment, Brent. Well, I, I wouldn't characterize that the Chinese are winning in the comprehensive competition with the West or specifically the United States, but the the risk of a of a outright confrontation, uh, a conflict, is becoming much more real, and that's costly to the collective West in a way that we're not really ready for, nor do we want to take on that loss. The Chinese, however, might perceive some narrow margins they can get success in a conflict. But that's, I wouldn't say that in the peacetime, this new Cold War that we're in, that the Chinese are, are actually getting ahead. Their economy, quite frankly, is under severe strain and it is contracting. And it's important to note that in 2001, Russia and China, after they had ostensibly come to an understanding of their territorial disputes, they signed a strategic pact, uh, a strategic partnership uh, for 20 years. Now, the renewal of that came up, and there's a clause in that in that agreement that if they don't renew it for another 20 years, it will automatically renew for five for five more years, and then it will go out of force. Uh, in the lead up to the invasion of Ukraine, they, that, that agreement was allowed to lapse, and it is operating on borrowed time now for a few more years. Be interesting to see in Putin's visit in, in, to Beijing if this renewal, a formal renewal of that strategic partnership is in the offing. Now, also today, um, Lavrov met with his counterpart, uh, Mr. Wang, and they talked about talked international about peace international conference recognized by both Russia and Ukraine. And here I quote, with equal participation by all parties and where all peace plans are discussed fairly. Now, Vitaly, is that even, is that even possible? Would, I mean, is, is this something we, 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 I mean, we can consider? Um, well, I've tried to find the logic behind the Chinese diplomatic statements, and it's so difficult because their approach is so inconsistent. So, yeah, we can just uh, judge by the fact that China was silent for uh, eight, eight years, for the first entire year of the war, and only after that it ca uh, they came up with the peace plan, peace position, uh, 12 points, obviously most of them were um, just uh, non-implementable, I believe. And uh, after that, they indeed they accepted the invitation of Ukraine to join these discussions of, on uh, Ukraine's peace formula proposed by Volodymyr Zelensky. And um, yeah, for the first uh, meeting, they were absent. For the second one in Jeddah, they did attend. And then they again disappeared, although... Uh, yeah, they voiced the, their support for the discussions of the peace settlement, diplomatic settlement, and they also appointed a career diplomat, uh, Li Hui, who was supposed to work hard on somehow uh, bridging this gap and building mutual trust, but I don't see that it works. Uh, and I don't think it would work, in fact, because, uh, well, we already seen and we already know that, uh, for instance, Russia has uh, yeah, implemented these laws which basically um, promote further annexation of Ukrainian territory and Russia is still holding around 13% of uh, Ukraine's sovereign territory. And I don't see how China can here promote uh, something uh, really meaningful 
uh, and I, I just don't see how they want to bring Russia in this process so uh, so far because Russia is not uh, clearly not ready for any negotiations. Well, China we see says, that from the mobilization. Yeah. China says it's actually in dialogue with Switzerland in, with Switzerland about this topic. So we'll see. You mentioned Switzerland. I want to uh, also add the European layer to this, Brent. Uh, just uh, briefly at the end, I mean, Mr. Macron mm -hmm. is also expected to host Mr. Xi. Jinping, uh, apparently in the next sort of month or two. Um, he's traveled himself to China last year, also sort of made himself a little bit uh, estranged to some European policy. There still isn't any real European, unified European policy when we look at China. I mean, what the Lithuanians, the Czechs are doing, very different from what the rest of Europe is doing, what Germany is doing. How much of is that a liability here as we move forward and in support of Ukraine and, and also this showdown between the United States and China? Yeah, while on the surface, China's diplomacy and strategy may seem inconsistent, and I agree, it, it is, but its its effect is, is singular, and that is to whittle away the unity of Western alliances like NATO. And so when you see Macron, you see German chancellors going to Beijing, even under very clearly Chinese support for the illegal invasion of Ukraine, it starts to undermine that unity. And so that's the, that's the focus of Chinese uh, activities. While they may be inconsistent in rhetoric and inconsistent indeed, they are consistent on what they're targeting, and that is the unity of NATO. And so it is a liability that needs to be addressed better. And the, the 75th anniversary of NATO's coming into force might be the time to reflect on that. All right, we'll see how it goes. Look, well, thank you both for that. Always great insights. That was Brent Sadler and Vitaly Arishko. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate you Thank both. You.